Hello, my name is Randy Marston, President of Marston Advisors, and today we're going over the proposed rule for MIPS in 2023. Just a quick statement that we are providing this for informational purposes only, and this does not constitute legal, financial, or medical advice. If you're new to Marston Advisors, welcome. Uh, most of our team got their start working for EHR software companies and medical practices. We launched our MIPS success program in 2016 to prepare for the QPP changes that are confusing to both vendors and practices. Uh, we have a combined experience of 50 years in EHR across our entire team. Uh, we are supporting over 250 practices nationwide. Uh, that's 1,400 individual clinicians, uh, taking over all the MIPS reporting for them each year. Uh, besides MIPS, we also help practices switch between EHR and practice management systems, and we are performing over 100 of those each year. Uh, and as you can see, uh, for the latest public results that are available, our customers always come up on top and above the national average and median uh, for MIPS reporting. And in 2020, our median score for all of our customers was a full 100 points. Speaking today on the proposed changes is Jessica Peterson, our VP of Health Policy. She's going to take you through the top proposed changes to QBP across each category with a focus on the uh, specialties that we focus on, which is ophthalmology, optometry, dermatology, and plastic surgery. We'll also go through the rulemaking process and commenting on how you can get involved to make sure that the program works in your favor for next year. We'll also go over how we help our practices succeed. Take it away, Jessica. Thanks, Randy. All right, so let's start with a brief overview of the QPP. What is the QPP? It stands for the Quality Payment Program. The QPP was established by the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, commonly known as MACRA. This was a fantastic law in that it finally ended the Sustainable Growth Rate Formula, or SGR. If you're not familiar with this, this is what required Congress to make those dock fixes every spring to avoid huge payment cuts under Medicare. So we were all very excited when that happened, but it also established the rules for the road for what Congress termed value-based care, which established the QPP. There are two ways to participate in the QPP. One is through advanced alternative payment models or advanced APMs. These require you to take on financial risk. Most physicians are not in an advanced APM, but participate in the QPP using fee for service. And that track is called MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. So changes to thresholds and payment adjustments under MIPS for 2023 that are being proposed, there actually are no changes. Um, below 75, you get a penalty. At 75 points for your MIPS final score, you get no payment adjustment. And above 75, so 75.01 and above, you get a bonus. What is different is that the exceptional performance bonus expires at the end of this year. So 2022 is the last year that you can get an exceptional performance bonus based on your performance. So that would be applied in 2024. So the reason for this is that under statute, it expired. So instead of getting uh, having a separate exceptional performance threshold, anyone who gets 75.01 and above will get that orange X percent bonus you see on your screen. This is the budget neutral bonus. It's determined on a linear sliding scale. So the better you do, the more you get. But as I mentioned, it's budget neutral. And what that means is that the total bonus money is, is, comes from the pool of penalty monies. So the amount that you get also depends on how many other providers are penalized and by how much. There were no proposed changes to how you're scored under MIPS. Quality and cost are still 30% of your MIPS final score. Promoting interoperability is still 25%, and improvement activities still 15%. And there's also the complex patient bonus, which is added on to your MIPS final score if you see patients that qualify as complex based on several factors, like are they dual eligible? And that's up to 10 points, same as last year. What is new starting in 2023 is another way to participate in MIPS. The MIPS that we're all familiar with is now known as traditional MIPS, and the MIPS 
that CMS says is of the future is called the MIPS Value Pathways, or MVPs. They were originally slated to begin during COVID, but because of COVID, they were pushed back to 2023, so they get to start next year. CMS says that MIPS value pathways are a way to have more cohesive participation experience for clinicians by connecting activities and measures from the four MIPS categories that are relevant to a specialty, a medical condition, or an episode of care. Initially, they will be voluntary. However, CMS does ev eventually plan to make them mandatory. There's no timeline for this because there's a lot of work to do before that can happen but I just wanna make you aware that they're voluntary for now, but eventually will become mandatory. And another unique feature of MIPS value pathways is that if you're in a multi-specialty group, you can separate out and report via specialty specific subgroups. That is voluntary for now. And in 2026, if you are participating in an MVP, that will be mandatory. These are proposals. These are things that were previously finalized, but since they're starting next year, I wanna give you a brief overview. These are the available MIPS value pathways. So there are seven that were previously finalized and five that were proposed in this year's rule. The proposed ones include one on cancer care, kidney health, two on neurological conditions, and one on promoting wellness, which is a primary care focused MVP. As you can see, there are a lot of specialties and conditions that wouldn't be captured by these MVPs. That's why there's no timeline on making these mandatory because to get an MVP that captures everybody, so enough MVPs that all clinicians could realistically and appropriately be captured by an MVP is gonna take a lot of work. So quick overview of MIPS value pathways, because there aren't a lot of MIPS value pathways, we don't anticipate a lot of participation, especially during their first pilot year in MIPS, but I wanna make you aware of them as they are the future of MIPS. So just like MIPS, there are four categories. The quality performance category, which in which the MVP participant would select four quality measures, one of which must be an outcome measure, improvement activities. This is uh, the way this is scored for an MVP is similar to how it's scored for small practices. You do two medium weighted improvement activities or one high weighted improvement activity, or you participate in a patient centered medical home, which is primary care focused. The activities that you have to choose from will be specific to the MVP related to the condition or specialty that the MVP is focused on. And for the cost performance category, you'll be scored on cost measures that are included in that specific MVP. The fourth category is a little different. It's called a foundational layer. This means that it's the same across all MVPs. The foundational layer consists of two components. One is population health measures. So when you register to be an MVP participant, which happens from April 1st to November 30th of the year prior, you have to select a population health measure to be scored on. These results will be added to your quality performance score. And then promoting interoperability is exactly the same as it is under traditional MIPS. Now, as I mentioned, MVPs are a little unique in that they allow for subgroups. There were proposals in this year's rule for relating to how subgroups will be scored. So for the quality performance category, subgroups will be scored on what they report unless they report on an outcomes-based administrative claims measure. If that's the case, they'll receive the group score, so their TIN level score. However, if there is no group score available, they would get a zero out of 10 for that measure. So that's important to note if you're considering MVPs in the future. For improvement activities, the score will be based on what the subgroup reports. For cost, it will be based again on the group score. However, if there is no group score on like quality, you'll just be excluded from the measure. And then for the foundational layer, there again are the two portions, population health and promoting interoperability. For the population health measures, you will get the group score, but if there's no group score available, much like cost, you'll just be excluded from that um, from that measure for your subgroup final score. And for promoting interoperability, it's just based on what the subgroup reports. So to summarize, improvement activities and promoting interoperability are proposed to be based on what the subgroup reports and cost, quality, and population health 
uh, administrative claims quality measures, I should say, and population health measures are proposed to be scored based on the affiliated group score. I know that's a lot to take in, but just think of this as an overview for now. As MIPS value pathways become more developed and more people participate, we'll have more information for you to help you decide which path pathway is best for you. So that brings us to what most of you are probably here for, which is traditional MIPS. We're gonna start with the quality category. So some basics on the quality category, it's a full year reporting period. You can earn up to 60 points within the category. You must report on six measures, at least one of which must be an outcome or high priority measure, and it's worth 30% of your MIPS final score. So this is all the same as last year. One thing that's exciting is that CMS did not propose to remove the small practice bonus. Therefore, you're definitely going to keep the small practice six point bonus for 2023. There are some MIPS um, quality measure scoring changes for 2023 though. So one of the change categories is the measure point floor. This actually isn't a proposal. This was finalized last year, but since it's taking effect next year, we wanna remind you and make sure you're aware. For small practices, there will be no change in the, in the point floor. You'll still get three out of 10 points on every measure you report, even if they don't meet data completeness or case minimum. For larger practices, however, that's 16 or more clinicians, the three point floor will be going away. So measures that are benchmarked will receive between one and 10 points based on your performance. Measures without a benchmark or submissions in which case minimum or data completeness isn't met will receive zero out of 10 points. So this is an important change, particularly for large practices to be aware of. Speaking of data completeness, it will stay the same in 2023 as it currently is at 70%. However, CMS is proposing to increase it from 70 to 75% for performance years 2024 and 2025. It's important to note that they really called out 2024 and 2025. That means that in the future, they're definitely gonna be proposing to increase it further. So this is a point where I would recommend if you're currently doing manual or claims reporting, you reevaluate whether or not you can get on an electronic reporting basis because it's going to get increasingly more difficult to report and to get a good score if you're manually reporting as the data completeness threshold goes up. So next up is benchmarks. I mentioned ben benchmarks on the previous slide in relation to the point floor. Benchmarks are the way that CMS scores quality measures. They are based on data from two years prior to the performance period. So this year in 2022, the measures will be scored based on 2020 performance data. We use this data to track your score throughout the year so that you and we know exactly how well you're doing. There aren't any proposed changes that will affect most specialists. However, CMS is proposing to change the administrative claims benchmark period. Rather than using data from two years prior, what's normally called a historical benchmark, they propose to use a benchmark calculated from the performance period data. This means that if you report a measure um, for the 2022 performance year, it would be scored based on other people who also reported it during the 2022 performance year. The reason they are doing this is because some of the, the new administrative claims measures have performance periods that are two or three years long. So using a historical benchmark from two years prior would actually overlap with that measure's performance period. So that's why it's only applying to administrative claims measures and why it would have to be more flexible for those measures. There are a lot of proposed changes to the 2023 MIPS quality measures. There are nine new measures, including one new administrative claims measure, which is on acute cardiovascular related hospital admission rates for patients with heart failure. There are 75 measures that are currently existing under the program with substantive changes. And there are 17 measures being proposed for removal from traditional MIPS. Two of those measures are being proposed to be kept for MVP use only. Those two are measures 110 and 111, which are flu immunization and pneumococcal vaccination. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Randy to go over the top proposed measure changes for next year. 
Thanks, Jessica. One of the things that makes our reporting program unique is how deeply knowledgeable our client success managers are with our core specialties. Let's take a look at the changes on the horizon for each specialty, starting with ophthalmology and optometry. For measure 117, CMS is proposing to remove it from claims because it is topped out, similar to measure 14. However, for other forms of reporting, like clinical quality measures or e-clinical quality measures, this measure can still be used. For CQM, CMS is proposing a clarification that the age at the date of the encounter be used to determine patient eligibility. And for eCQM, the proposal is that the patient age would be determined as the end of the year. Measure 191 has a proposed denominator exclusion for tractional retinal detachment, as well as an eCQM denominator exclusion for heteroanonymous bilateral field defects. These proposed exclusions are to keep this measure focused on a population without significant significant ocular conditions that could hinder clinician performance. For dermatology and plastic surgery, there are proposed changes to three measures as well as two new proposed measures. For measure 176, TB screening prior to first course of biologic therapy, CMS is proposing to revise the title to include immune response modifier therapy. CMS is also proposing to expand the denominator to include five additional biologics as listed above to align with the current therapies. They also clarify that the list of therapies is subject to change as new ones are approved by the FDA. For measure 265 biopsy follow-up, uh, CMS is proposing this measure for removal. Finally, there's a proposed change to 440 skin cancer biopsy reporting time. A new denominator exception is being proposed for a wide local excisions or re-excisions. This exception used to exist only as a denominator note, so this change is expected to have minimal effect. There are two new measures being proposed this year. Psoriasis improvement in patient reported itch severity is being proposed by CMS to address whether they see a gap in care for patients with psoriasis. A similar measure is being proposed for dermatitis as well. Since we may also report some general measures for our specialties, we've listed those here that have changes. If you happen to use any of these measures as well, check our guide that was sent along with this initial invite to the call. Uh, we will also send a copy along with the recording of today's presentation uh, later this day or tomorrow. I'll now hand you back to Jessica to take you through promoting interoperability. Thanks, Randy. All right, so now we're going to go over everyone's favorite category, promoting interoperability. This is the EHR category of MIPS. On the PI category. It's a 90 so some basics on PI, it's a 90 consecutive day reporting period. period. You can earn up to 100 the points within the category. Available there are 115 of which are available points, but you can only earn so up the to, um, itself is excuse me, points. there are 105 you available points, but you can only earn up to 100. You can't seven, get over 100% on, on this task. There are six measures. For each measure, you must submit measures. an attestation or a numerator an of at least one or, or claim an exclusion, one. or you get or a zero for the entire category. And PI is worth 25% of your MIPS final score. This is all the same as last year. The one big change is that beginning with the 2023 PI reporting period, whichever 90-day period you choose, you have to be on the 2015 edition as your cures EHR. update. This is because the so most people are on 2015 update edition cert. The cures update, however, is like the next step. So in order to be on a 2015 EHR edition standard expires at the, the end of 2022. Update. So anyone not on the cures update will not be on certified EHR. And that's why this is required. This isn't a proposal. This is something that was previously finalized by CMS that you have to be on certified EHR for your reporting period for PI. So just a quick update to make sure that you check with your EHR vendor to see where they are in their progress at becoming certified or if they plan to be certified because you wanna make sure that you're not caught unawares next year. Hardship exception options. So for people who don't feel that they can, um, they can accurately or without extreme burden report the PI category of MIPS, there are hardships. These are the same as in previous years. And I wanna point out that small practices will still get the automatic PI reweighting unless they report any PI data. 
So there were some pretty big changes to measures proposed for 2023. I'll start with the points available. As you can see, a lot of um, yellow is highlighted on the screen. Those are the changes. Each measure, except for the e-prescribing measure, has a different point total than in previous years. And this is because CMS is proposing two big changes. One is they're making the query of the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, or PDMP, mandatory rather than a 10-point bonus. This is because obviously there is still an opiate epidemic in this country. CMS really wants to emphasize that this is an important thing for doctors to be aware of and to check before they transmit any electronic prescriptions. There are two exceptions, sorry, exclusions for this measure. One is for those who are legally unable to e-prescribe these medications by applicable law. So whether that's state or local law, and another is for those who order 100 or fewer prescriptions. CMS is unclear in their rule on whether or not this would be those who order 100 or fewer opiate or scheduled prescriptions, or if it's 100 or fewer prescriptions. My guess is that they mean opiate or scheduled prescriptions, but we are asking for clarification. The next big change is in the health information exchange objective. Most people do two measures for this objective, the sending health information and receiving and reconciling health information measures. These are about sending patient information to someone that you refer to and getting it back. For this, last year, they added the bi-directional exchange measure as an option in place of those two HIE measures. This year, they're proposing to add another option instead of bi-directional exchange or the two HIE measures, and that's a measure called TEFCA. TEFCA is the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. You don't really need to know much about it right now. Long and short is that TEFCA is very, very new. The conditions for participation were just publicized in January, and we don't really anticipate that there will be enough entities up and running in the TEFCA network for clinicians to feasibly join them. So this is something to keep an eye on, but it's an option, and it's an option a lot of clinicians will not be able to use in 2023. As it evolves, we'll give you more details. But because of the uh, proposed change by making query of PDMP required, they are also decreasing the sending and receiving measures by five points each, or if you choose the bi-directional bidire exchange or TEFCA, the, the objective will be worth 30 instead of 40 points. And finally, there's an exchange to the public health and clinical data exchange objective. This used to be worth 10 points. They're upping that to 25 points next year. That's the proposal, at least. The reason they're doing this is that they believe it reflects the importance of a comprehensive nationwide healthcare data exchange between MIPS eligible clinicians and public health agencies. This is really in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the difficulty we had in getting information about what was going on in the clinic, at the state, and at regional levels. So they really want to emphasize the importance of this objective. So some more details on the query of the PDMP measure. Like I said, this is proposed to be required starting next year, and it will have two exclusions that I've already gone over. Another thing that's changed is when this was a bonus measure, it was just for Schedule II opiates. Now, it's also for Schedule three or four drugs that are electronically prescribed using CERT. So what this is saying is we're, it's not just focused on opiates anymore. They're expanding it to medications, Schedule two, three, and four. That's the proposal. This was also proposed in the other fee schedule rules, such as the inpatient fee schedule. And the final rule for that is expected to come out soon. So I anticipate that this will likely be a finalized change. I wanna note that checking the PDMP has to occur prior to transmitting the prescription. So if you are required to use, uh, do promoting interoperability, make sure that you check the PDMP before you send out any of these scheduled medications. That being said, this is still an attestation-based measure. That means this is a yes or no. Did you do it or did you not? In the future, they're, they're likely going to make this a numerator, denominator, performance-based measure. But for now, it is yes or no. Did you do it? 
There are some additional proposed changes to the public health and clinical data exchange objective. These are changes to what's called active engagement. Currently, in order to check the box that you are participating in a registry, you have to be in what's called active engagement with that registry. The three current options are that you have completed registration. So you've just registered with the registry. The second is that you're in the testing and data validation stage. This is when you're working with the registry to make sure that your data can be transmitted and that it's accurate when you transmit it. And then the third option is production. This is when you're fully integrated and sending data electronically with the registry. The proposed change is that CMS is proposing to consolidate options, current options one and two into an option called pre-production and validation. And then change the uh, option three, production to validated data production, but that's really only a title change. So the big thing here is that rather than having two different options before you're in full production mode where you're fully integrated, sending and receiving data with the registry, you're just going to have one. And this aligns with another proposed change that CMS is making. They're proposing that clinicians will have to report their level of active engagement with each registry that they check the box for when they report PI. They're also proposing to limit active engagement option one to one year per registry. This means if you have only registered or you're still in testing and validation for a registry, you can only do that for one year. If you're still in that after two years, you're not gonna get any credit for that. You'll have to check the box now. However, if you switch registries, then you can start that process over and get that additional year back. This is a little confusing, um, but it is CMS's way of making sure that people don't just stick around in just having registered, because as registries have been more developed, they are getting more and more um, efficient at onboarding people. So I don't anticipate that this change will really impact our clients because most of them are in production level. But if you are having any trouble getting to production level, that is something we can help you out with as well. Then finally, in addition to the measures, required for PI, there are also attestation statements. These are things that you have to check the box on in order to get a PI score, but that you're not directly scored on. The only change to this list proposed for 2023, it's actually not proposed, as I said, it's previously finalized, is that rather than checking the box on using 2015 CERT or the 2015 CERT Cures update, it can only be the 2015 CERT Cures update. So that's it for PI. Now we can move on to improvement activities. So some quick basics on the improvement activities category. It's a 90 consecutive day reporting minimum, just like PI. The two categories don't need to be on the same 90 days though. You can earn up to 40 points within the category and you can do this a number of ways. You can report on high priority measures or high weighted measures, which are worth 20 points medium weighted measures, which are worth 10 points, and they're worth double that if you're in a small practice, a rural practice, or a health professional shortage area. And IA is worth 15% of your MIPS final score. This is all the same as last year, no changes to the basics. What has changed is that CMS has proposed some pretty significant modifications and removals to improvement activities. They've proposed to modify five improvement activities, including one that we use pretty frequently, which is the use of QCDR data or Qualified Clinical Data Registry data for ongoing practice assessment and improvements. This is a medium weighted activity. What they're proposing is to consolidate all of the other improvement activities related to QCDR participation into this activity. And that includes removal of one of the other activities that we use, which is use of QCDR feedback reports that incorporate population health. This is a high weighted activity. So this would be one of the ones that would be consolidated into this medium weighted activity. That's one of the six remo uh, proposed removals of IAs as well. CMS is also proposing four new improvement activities, including a couple that we thought were quite interesting. Uh, create and implement a language access plan, which is high weighted and COVID-19 vaccination for practice staff. We figure that one's a pretty, pretty easy lift and that one is medium weighted. 
So that's it for improvement activities. And now we're in the home stretch, cost. Quick cost basics. It's a full year reporting period. The max number of points you can get within the category depends on how many measures you're eligible for. So if you're only eligible for one measure, since each are worth 10 points, your category score will be out of 10 points. If you're eligible for two, it will be 20, et cetera. Though this uh, category is scored in real time, no one has access to that data until final scores are released the summer after the performance period. Cost is worth 30% of your MIPS final score, and there's no work to report it. It's all done on the back end using administrative claims data. There was one proposed change this year, and that is to reinstate the improvement scores starting with 2022. So this is a re retroactive proposal. The improvement score is up to 1% on top of your category score for measure score improvement from the prior year. So if you improve on, say, your cataracts, your cataract cost measure score, that improvement percent can go toward your cost category score. So speaking of measures, there were no proposed changes to any of the episode-based cost measures, including cataract and melanoma cost measures. There was, however, a proposal to add a new episode-based cost measure, a measure that currently exists. It's the Medicare Spending Per Beneficiary, or MSPB measure. There are no changes to the measure, and this is still an inpatient measure. So it won't impact the measure or who it is applied to under MIPS. It's really just to make sure that CMS has enough episode-based cost measures and that things are categorized correctly. As with previous years, most specialists remain removed from the total per capita cost or TPCC measure. There were no proposed changes here. Nurse practitioners and uh, physician assistants, however, are still subject to TPCC. Keep that in mind when you're estimating which categories you'll be scored on. And then more details on the cost improvement score. So the point of this is really to reward measure specific improvement from the prior year. In order to get a cost improvement score, CMS proposes to require, quote, data sufficient to measure improvement to be available. What this means is that if you're participating as a clinician or group, you must be participating in MIPS using the same TIN or TIN MPI combination as you were in the previous year. In addition, you have to be scored on the same cost measure or measures as the previous performance period. So since this hasn't really rolled out, it's unclear how they're going to implement these proposals, but it does really limit, especially as they add new cost measures, uh, the amount of improvement score people will be eligible for. Now that's it for the proposed changes. So what can you do about it? So if any of the proposed changes or the discussions about what they're going to do in the future are things you're not approving of or things that you strongly approve of, you can submit comments. So each year when CMS releases the proposed rule, they open up a 60 day comment window in which members of the public and stakeholders can submit public comments on what has been proposed. These comments are due September 6th of this year at 8 p.m. Eastern time and comments are reviewed by CMS and any accepted changes are incorporated into the final rule, which has to be published by November. I do wanna make you guys aware that what we currently have available is not the final federal register, that's where regulations are published version. However, there are very rarely any changes between a, uh, uh, a pre-publication version and a post-publication version. If there are any changes, we'll be sure to let you know with an email blast. And of course, Marsden advisors will be submitting comments on any changes that are relevant to our specialists. We'll also be setting up a tool to help you comment if you would like, and you'll see that in the coming weeks. And as always, if you're interested in assistance, we're here to help. And Randy, I'm gonna pass it off to you for more details. Thanks, Jessica. So if you aren't working with us already, uh, we have pretty much two different paths you can choose. If you are comfortable with doing MIPS yourself, we have a lot of free tools that are available for you to use. Uh, Valview.app, formerly MIPSestimator.org, is our online MIPS tracking tool. It's completely free. You can use that to estimate your MIPS score throughout the year. That way, you know exactly what to expect by the time the year ends. Uh, I previously mentioned our YouTube channel. There's a quick link here, mrsdn.com slash YT. That way you can go subscribe to that channel. 
and a copy of today's presentation will be available there as well. Uh, we also have our MIPS planner. This is a uh, mouse pad calendar that has all the important dates and things you need to know about MIPS throughout the year. We still have a few available for 2022. So if you'd like that, uh, go ahead and check out mrsdn.com slash planner, uh, enter in your address and we'll send that out to you. Uh, otherwise, if you want this taken care of yourself, uh, we are a full service MIPS consulting company. We pretty much take over everything that you need to do, including researching the rules like we've done today, uh, setting up the measures in your systems, training your staff, uh, working with your registries and EHRs on, on any technical issues, uh, tracking your scores throughout the year, submitting the data, and then also reporting on any feedback that CMS provides after the program ends. Uh, we are still accepting a few limited clients for 2022, uh, and we're also available for 2023 reporting. Our pricing is based on the number of clinicians starting at 149 per month per full-time clinician. Uh, we'll include information on this in our wrap-up email along with a copy of the presentation uh, and a uh, top changes report. And if you have any questions on this, you'd like more information, you can email us at getstarted at marstonadvisors.com.